From Vermont Public, this is Brave Little State. I'm Josh Crane. And I'm Sabine Pooks. Wesley Davis grew up in the woods, specifically the woods around Mount Holly. But there was always one place where he could be high above the trees. I I remember the first time going up there, it was like weird, kind of surreal. Like it looks kind of like a radio tower or something, but just amazing to get above the tree line. talking about the fire tower on the summit of nearby Ludlow Mountain at Okemo. On top of the tower, Wesley and his siblings could see for miles. It's close enough to our house so you can figure out, okay, that's, you know, our neighbor's property and that's the lake or whatever and there's the farmhouse, you know. It's, it's neat. As Wesley remembers, the tower was made of metal and had four or five flights of wooden stairs. It was tagged with graffiti, and there was often broken glass at the base, probably left behind from some high school party. The remains of an old cabin sat nearby. At the time, it all just seemed really old. So I never really understood what the purpose of it was. I always knew it was for fire, but I was like, well, it's not like we have fire that much in Vermont. Fast forward to today. The fire tower that Wesley grew up with on Ludlow is about 100 years old. By our count, it's one of 38 total fire towers that were built in Vermont. And it's one of just 13 that's still climbable, minus those that are temporarily closed for repairs. But Wesley's also interested in the ones that aren't so easy to find. And like those are ones that probably interested me the most. For example, the one on Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel. That's a peak in Chittenden that Wesley can see from his back porch, and he's heard there used to be a fire tower there. That got him thinking about all the other towers that might be sitting in the woods forgotten, and it reignited his earlier curiosity about why they were put there in the first place. Welcome to Brave Little State, Vermont Public's listener-powered journalism show. I'm Josh Crane. Here on the show, we answer questions about Vermont that have been asked and voted on by you, our audience, because we want our journalism to be more inclusive, more transparent, and more fun. Today, what is the history of the fire towers scattered across Vermont's peaks? How many were there, and how many are still standing? A question from Wesley Davis of Chittenden about those tall wood or metal structures on top of mountains. And Wesley isn't the only Vermonter to wonder about them. A lot of you have asked us, what's up with the fire towers? Reporter Sabine Pooks searches for answers in the early 1900s, when timberland owners and railroads ruled the Vermont landscape. He was willing to finance the construction of the first tower. And she arrives at the doorstep of a couple that found a lifetime of artistic inspiration as fire tower lookouts in southern Vermont. Everybody was doing something. They had their reasons for being there. We're a proud member of the NPR Network. Welcome. Support for Brave Little State comes from Sunset Lake CBD, a farmer-owned company crafting CBD products with Vermont-grown hemp. Their product listing and information on home delivery available at sunsetlakecbd.com. And City Market, a community-owned food co-op celebrating 50 years of food with purpose. Become a member at citymarket.coop slash membership. My hunt for answers starts with some beginner's luck. On my first day of reporting, I'm told to get in touch with Luke O'Brien. He's a forest recreation specialist with the state of Vermont. I give him a call, and he just so happens to be standing on top of the state's oldest fire tower on Burke Mountain, working on some repairs. I join him up there the next day. Well, should we go up? Yeah, let's go check it out. Sweet. It's an impressive structure, ladders zigzagging up the tower's metal torso into the clouds. Climbing up it feels a little treacherous. You know, three points of contact maybe. And okay. Take it easy. 
The fire tower on Burke in the Northeast Kingdom is the oldest and one of the tallest towers in the state, with sweeping views of Willoughby Gap and the green and white mountains. The cab of the tower, that's the small closed-in hut at the top, is tagged with the names and initials of visitors who've proudly stomached the daunting heights and ripping wind to get to this point. It's distracting with the wind. Yeah. It's hard, it's hard to concentrate. But it's amazing. We get out of the wind and head to the base of the tower to chat. A ski lift sits idle nearby in summer hibernation. And a few yards away, there is another tower that stands even taller. What is this broadcast tower we're looking at? I think it's for Vermont Public Radio. and <laughs> Vermont Public, I should say. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot of infrastructure here on Burke. Um, this Luke has been restoring fire towers like this one for more than 20 years. He's also a self-described fire tower geek. And he says the story of Vermont's towers begins a very long time ago. Uh, many people refer to the Northeast as the asbestos forest that doesn't burn. But I, I think that some of the land practices back in the early 1900s combined to contribute to, to a number of forest fires. When European settlers first came to Vermont, they cleared forests to build farms. Later on, companies built railroads, also out of wood, to haul all that lumber. That meant there was a lot of dry wood sitting around, waiting to catch fire. In the early 1900s, a series of wildfires burned more than 15,000 acres across Vermont. So it was quite large, more than your average uh, small forest or field fire. So I, I think it drew the attention of folks. Those fires cost the state a fortune and set in motion a few big changes. In 1904, the state set up a system of local fire wardens. And a few years later, it created a division of forestry and appointed its first ever state forester. It was that forester who decided to set up towers across the state's highest peaks based off a similar system that already existed in Maine. That system came highly recommended. In a letter to the Vermont forester, one Timberland owner from Maine wrote that his state system was, quote, the very best protection that could be possibly had against forest fires. In Vermont, wealthy landowners paid for the construction of the early towers, which helped them protect their own forests and property. The tower on Burke Mountain was financed by Elmer Darling, who owned the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York City and had roots in the nearby town. He, over time, acquired quite a bit of land, including much of Burke Mountain, and he wanted to protect that land, and he, he was willing to finance the construction of the first tower. And so Vermont's fire tower program was born. The state paid lookouts $2 a day to stand watch. Over the years, the program grew. In the 1930s and 40s, the Civilian Conservation Corps built even more towers and restored some of the older ones. And this time, they were using steel. A storm in 1938 had knocked over a wooden tower at Burke. Steel proved to be more durable. In total, there were 38 towers built, along with many corresponding cabins. They were staffed during the dry season from late spring to early fall, and most of them were in the Northeast Kingdom, where wildfires hit the hardest. When lookouts weren't spotting fires, they were doing a lot of mundane tasks, according to records Luke found at an old lookout cabin. Uh, not a lot of excitement there, a few, uh, a few uh, smokes spotted, but, but mostly hauling water, painting sheds, and taking care of the infrastructure there. It seems like it would take a very patient person, or a person who really appreciates being alone. Yeah, yep. Enter Hugh and Jean Jowdry. Hi. (laughs) Good to see you. Are you a hugger? I'm not a hugger. For people who spent 37 summers of their lives in a cabin in the woods on top of a mountain, Hugh and Jean are surprisingly outgoing. How old are you two? Uh, no, you're 94. 14, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just turned 79. I'm, I'll be 86 soon. Yeah. Yeah, so you're going for it. I'm going, absolutely. <laughs> you're going for it. When Hugh and Jean were in their 20s, they took jobs as fire watchers on top of Stratton Mountain in southern Vermont. Recently married and looking for adventure, the couple joined just as the program was starting to wind down in the 60s, and they stayed for 11 years. Today, they live at the base of Stratton, in a cabin that's filled every inch with books and art. 
paintings by Jean, and sculptures by Hugh. In early September, I joined them on their screened-in porch, along with today's question asker, Wesley, and his baby, Viri. Room, I think, for everybody. Definitely. Yeah. There'll be a little more room once I finish doing your diaper, sure. sorry. Yeah. Sure. Wesley and I are here to get an answer to his question about the history of fire towers in Vermont. But there are some other questions that Hugh already knows we're going to ask, because, well, everyone does. Four questions I, I, I condensed it to. Number one... Uh, doesn't it get lonely up here? Number two, what do you do? Number three, how did you get a job like this? And number four, when are you leaving? They're interesting questions, and they're the types of questions, after all, that have become the center of so much fire tower lore, like in Jack Kerouac's novel, The Dharma Bums. The book ends with the protagonist working as a lookout on Desolation Peak, searching for truth. He writes about meditating one night outside the tower. Quote, Here indeed was the great truth cloud, Dharma Mega, the ultimate goal. That interest in spiritual contemplation is partly what brought the Jowdrys up to Stratton in the first place. They were living in Buffalo, New York. Hugh was a math teacher, and Jean was a graphic designer. And then we said, well, this is kind of boring. What are we going to do with the rest of our lives? At the time, Hugh was in a playwriting course. That's where he met a friend who he found incredibly serene. So I finally asked him, I said, how can you sit there like that so still when all this is going on? He says, well, John, I'll tell you. In the springtime, I go to Okemo Mountain, and I go up in the fire tower with a lot of books, and I just watch for fires. I said, they pay you to watch for fires? Just to sit up there and do that? Can I get a job like that? You know, I want to get out. Hugh says he was looking for intellectual adventure and time to read books about mythology and philosophy. Jean wanted some space to paint and to figure out what was next. The job of Fire Tower Lookout fit the bill for them both. Luckily, the watch on Stratton was ready to move on. Hugh's friend wrote down the number for a contact with the Forest Service and told Hugh to give him a call. So in May 1968, Hugh and Jean took a chairlift up to the top of Stratton to start their new job and meet their supervisor. He had his doubts, you know, we we looked like nervous city slickers and we wouldn't really last last the season. (laughs) So he says, very few words, you know, he says, just learn your territory, you, and see you later. And there we were, isolated in this uh, snow-covered... It's May May 21st and it's, Mm -hmm. it's snowing heavily. Hugh and Jean were to stay in a tiny cabin near the fire tower and report down to the base twice a day, using a radio. All the while, they were scanning the vast landscape below. Here's question asker Wesley again. <laughs> when you say scan, do you mean scanning with the naked eye or with binoculars? With no, the naked eye. Yeah. You, you sort of know the ridge lines totally and that whole thing, and then something stops. You don't even know why you're stopping. Reports weren't always met with the urgency that Hugh and Jean expected, having come from the city. Hugh recalls one particularly slow-going call in his first year of fire spotting. And I spotted a smoke over here in Sheldon Hill, and I called the warden up, and I said, well, um, would you please check it out? Yeah? Hmm, that's a long pause. Oh, yeah. So, uh, okay, um, I'll see you later then. <laughs> okay, so three days later, I got a ring on the phone. He says, I got it. That's, That's right. all, no, five words. And whole... <laughs> <laughs> Things were slow. Still, Jean says their jobs felt important in a time when the conservation movement was picking up steam and the country was celebrating its first ever Earth Day. When they weren't fire spotting, the Jowdrys tended to their mountaintop garden and made frequent trips to a water spring a quarter mile away. They made pets out of the wild hares and subsisted off what Jean calls a Spartan diet of ham, spam, and spaghettios. It's a wonder we lived. You <laughs> can do a lot. Yeah. How much were you guys making a season for this work? Oh, oh about five bucks maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably uh, probably about ninety dollars every every two weeks. This was a time before hikers frequented Stratton Mountain, so Hugh and Jean were mostly completely alone. So they had plenty of time to get to their books. 
Jean says they read to one another at night as a way to connect. The first author they read together was Dostoevsky, a Russian writer who wrote long philosophical novels. I was reading it like, you know, this lamp was, was asthmatic, you know, it was a Coleman lantern, and there's this misery, this Russian misery. In this. <laughs> Maybe if you read the darkest books possible, you, you realize, you, realize no story, you, you have no somebody, somebody you know? that's very nice with you. Hughes says the solitude changed his life. What happened was, it was so different, the environment, mentally and physically, that I started, I, I started having dreams in which there was no narrative. I said, what the? There's no story. You're here, man. You're, it's okay now. We weren't talking to anybody but each other for the most part. I guess I was expecting that the isolation would be a pitfall of the job or something for lookouts to put up with. But according to Jean, it was actually a draw. And not just for them, but for the other lookouts around Vermont, too. There was a woman on... Uh, Mount Olga, she was planning on becoming a nun, and she wanted, she liked the solitude. And of course, Fran was reading his thousand books, <laughs> and you know, aspiring to be a writer. That was the adventure. Writer. Right. There was a teenage woman on Burke who they talked to sometimes on the radio, and a friend on Elmore who was translating Tibetan poetry to English. Everybody was doing something that they had the reasons for being there. And Hugh got around to writing his play about tourism and real estate development around Stratton. The play was later produced and broadcast by public radio station WFCR in Amherst, Massachusetts. And now, in stereo, we present Visitors, an original non-drama by Hugh Jowdry. Bang, bang, bang against the trees. Down they go. Bang, bang, bang. It's pretty abstract. Doesn't it get lonely here? How do you get your food? What do you do in the winter? Didn't you have to get certified to sit here? Is that all you do is sit around here? What do you do in the winter? From the late 60s to the late 70s, Hugh and Jean thrived as fire lookouts on Stratton Mountain. Then something changed. Vermont's fire tower program came to an end. So in 1979, Hugh and Jean packed their bags and headed for a different wilderness. New York City. Coming up, the end and rebirth of Vermont's fire tower program. They're, they're still quite popular. As you can see here, we're, we're still trying to keep them in good shape for the public. We'll be right back. Support of Brave Little State comes from Vermont Fish and Wildlife, working to conserve the state's wild places and their natural communities through the 2023 Vermont Habitat Stamp. VTFishandWildlife.com By the late 1970s, Vermont had phased out pretty much all of its fire towers. One reason for the shift was that there just weren't as many wildfires anymore. The lumber and railroad industries that had caused so many fires earlier on were no longer threats to the landscape. And thanks to campaigns like Smokey the Bear, the public had a better sense of how to be safe when it came to preventing fires. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. But the state faced a new problem. What to do with all those old towers? Its answer was to put many of them on the market for just a dollar a piece. As the Associated Press reported at the time, there was a catch. Buyers had to go get, dismantle, and haul out the towers themselves, many of which weren't accessible by road. It was a hard sell. When it came to watching for fires, the state switched to a new system. When fire danger was high, it sent up patrols and airplanes to keep watch. But even that strategy has petered out. Dan Dillner is the current forest fire supervisor for the state of Vermont. And he says the state hasn't sent up a plane in a while. So it's established. It's all planned so we could get them up in the air quickly. Um, We just haven't utilized it um, for a really long time. Haven't really had a need to. Today, almost all fires in Vermont are started by humans. So they're near people's homes. That, plus quicker emergency response services, means there are hundreds of thousands of civilian spotters around Vermont ready to make the call. In terms of like watching for fires, we don't, we don't 
you know, sit there and look for them. People call them in from 911, and, you know, fire departments respond very, very quickly. There are way fewer wildfires today than there were in the early 1900s due to Vermont's changing landscape and better prevention tactics. But there is a very important caveat. Climate change is causing more extreme weather in Vermont. And that means conditions can get much drier, which increases the risk of fires. At the same time, Vermont is also seeing really wet conditions. As we saw this year in June, until we started getting that excessive rain, um, we were in some pretty high fire danger. and We had a lot of potential. Um, in northern Quebec, obviously, didn't get the rain, and so they continued to have fires throughout the summer. But um, thankfully, we, we did, but then we got too much. Once again, Vermont finds itself having more days with a higher fire risk. For the first time, the state's hiring two full-time professional wildland firefighters, jobs that are already common out west. Dan Dillner's job, too, has changed in the last year to have more of a focus on wildfire prevention. Not all states have turned away from their fire lookouts. Out west, where fire risk is much higher, states are using a combination of automated lookout technology and old-school fire watches. There are still more than 70 lookouts in Washington and Oregon, and nearly 60 in California, according to the New York Times. And some states on the East Coast have actually reinstated their fire tower programs to address increasing risk. A few years ago, the state of Pennsylvania spent $4 million to build 16 new towers there. New Jersey and New Hampshire still use lookouts also. But if you're hoping to run into a fire lookout on one of Vermont's peaks in the near future, don't hold your breath. While Dan says nothing is completely out of the question, he says it's hard to imagine today that it would be necessary to bring back lookouts in Vermont. Still, many of the state's fire towers have gotten a second life. And it's why many of us know about these towers in the first place. The end of the fire tower program in Vermont coincided with the start of the modern hiking boom in the 1960s and 70s. Hikers could get unobstructed views from the tops of towers, a sort of reward for a long trek to the top. One ski resort even built a tower in the 1960s just to bring in more hikers in the off-season. The Green Mountain Club is rebuilding that tower next summer. They're, they're still quite popular, and uh, as you can see here, we're, we're still trying to keep them in good shape for the public. It's that popularity that brought Forestry's Luke O'Brien to the summit of Burke Mountain last month. The tower there hasn't been used as a fire lookout in about four decades, but now it's a lookout spot for visitors. Luke's replacing the wooden treads on the tower staircase, which have been worn down by weather and hiking boots. Here we're just doing a wholesale replacement of all the wooden parts. Uh, there's 72 treads on the Burke Mountain Fire Tower and six landings. So it's, it's a lot of wood, um, but we're chipping away at, at it you know, a little bit at a time. Some hikers have made a project out of visiting all the fire towers in Vermont. That's what siblings Marriott and Simon Aborn did early in the pandemic when they were living at their family's home in Manchester for the first time since high school. The first tower they visited was Mount Olga in Wilmington. And then I think just from there, we just started wondering about fire towers. We knew of a couple others that existed, and then we sort of started to generate the list from there. Marriott says making the list was half the fun. They did some research online and mapped out the towers that were open to the public. Some took them to parts of the state they had never seen. But even the towers in southern Vermont gave them new perspectives on familiar views. We have like a certain perception of what Stratton Mountain looks like, you know, growing up skiing there from the from the ski resort side. But you climb the, the fire tower and the top of Stratton Mountain looks really flat. It's really, it's like a, a pretty flat dome that's just totally at odds with, with how we've experienced it from below. As for Hugh and Jean Jowdry, after they left their fire lookout in 1979, they couldn't stay away forever. In New York, they found themselves often making the drive to hike and camp in the woods, upstate. So in 1996, they came back to their cabin in Fire Tower on Stratton, this time as caretakers with the Green Mountain Club. For almost three decades, the Jowdrys enjoyed their second wind on their mountain perch. But this time, many more people and... 
our duties were not that of fire, you know, watching for fire, but we always looked anyhow. I mean, why wouldn't you be looking? A lot had changed since Hugh and Jean left. The tower was now a lookout for tourists and through hikers who were coming by on the Appalachian and Long Trails. What was initially a monkish artist refuge had turned into quite the social scene. Jean and Hugh, delighted by the company, invited hikers into their cabin for tea when it was raining and on some occasions for pancakes. They maintained several miles of trails and met hikers from all over the world. Like the towers themselves, they became local legends. They met a man who was setting a speed record on the Appalachian Trail and stopped him for a quick autograph. In his book, the runner said he wished he had more time to talk to the wise old French-Canadian couple at the top of Stratton. Uh, Wouldn't you know, that day a guy from Georgia comes up and says, Hey, y'all, I know you got some wisdom to pass on. (laughs) So I says, oui, monsieur, uh, if you have maple syrup, s'il vous plaît, uh, keep it under lock and key. That's, that's, the, that's the way, okay, stick with the script. That's the, that's the wisdom. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure a lot of people saw you guys as these, like, enlightened mountain beings, right? Yes. Sometimes, yes. yes. Yeah. Is there truth to that? There is truth. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't I've been know. About it, you know. Last year, the couple retired so they could get back to focusing on their art. A younger caretaker took their place. They still live close to the mountain, a five-minute drive from the base. And they still go up to the top when they can to look around at the forest they know maybe better than anybody. I wouldn't wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I want to be right here. We got, we got, you know, the, the connections are too strong to be anywhere else at this point. Not all fire towers have stood the test of time, which brings us to this postscript in our story. First, some quick math. At the top, we told you there have been a total of 38 fire towers in Vermont. 13 of those towers are still standing and still climbable, though two of them are currently closed for repairs. A handful of others are privately owned. And that leaves about 20 that are no longer standing, including the fire tower on Mount Carmel, That's the one that sparked the curiosity of our question asker, Wesley Davis. Wesley's heard it's still out there, so we decided to go find it ourselves. On a cloudy Tuesday, colleague Joey Palumbo and I head to Chittenden and load up in Wesley's red pickup truck. Our mission is one of redemption. Wesley has tried to find this tower before on a nearby mountain. Long story short, we went up there and didn't find any fire towers. We head up the long trail a ways, past a group of through hikers, and then up Mount Carmel itself, bushwhacking our way through. Eventually, we rejoin a narrow trail. And then, all of a sudden... Oh my god. Oh wow. Like completely intact, just on its side. In the middle of what feels like nowhere, there's a huge (laughs) hunk of metal turned completely horizontal. The ladder running up its side is twisted like a roller coaster track, and it's overgrown with trees that have at parts wrapped fully around its legs. We later find out that the tower was toppled by the state in the 70s, likely because it was a liability issue. The cloud cover clears, and Wesley climbs up the tower's side. Like he did when he was a kid on Okimo, he looks out for landmarks. You can see mountaintop quite well. Yeah, the reservoir's due south. Cool. But yeah, you got to get up here soon. All right. I'm coming. I can see what Jean meant. It would be easy to spot a disturbance up here, a flash of orange or gray interrupting rolling green. Up here, there are no gondolas, no graffiti, no smashed up glass bottles, just metal and earth and us. Thanks so much for listening to the show. And thanks to Wesley Davis for the great question and for joining us in our reporting. To see a map we put together of all the fire towers in Vermont, past and present, head to our website, bravelittlestate.org. While you're there, be sure to sign up for the BLS newsletter. We're on Instagram and Reddit at BraveStateVT. This episode was reported by Sabine Pooks. 
who also did the mix and sound design. Produced and edited by me, Josh Crane. Additional support from Sophie Stevens, Corey Doxer, and Joey Palumbo. Angela Evansy is Brave Little State's executive producer. Our theme music is by Ty Gibbons. Other music by Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Mark Howow, Ron Kemnow, Mary Jo Llewellyn, Peter Hayes, Alan Thompson, Keegan Tierney, Prudence Doherty, Jules Sundberg, Liam Elder Connors, and Danielle Kovacs. Brave Little State is a production of Vermont Public. If you like our show, you can make a gift at bravelittlestate.org slash donate. Or leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We'll be back soon with more people-powered Vermont journalism. Thanks for listening. Black perspectives haven't always been centered in the telling of America's story. Now, we're taking center stage. Introducing NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of Black-led stories from NPR's podcasts. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts.